I didn't have as much time to like flesh out this presentation, but hopefully it's still useful. Um, it's about bad figures. So um, you guys probably already know this, but just to like reiterate why figures are an important thing. Um, it's generally for communicating complicated topics that you can't really communicate with text um, for like concepts, results, any trends. Um, and like one thing is that like, if you're short on time, like at least for me, I don't know about you guys, but like two main things I look at are abstract figures. So like good way to display like the content of your um, paper in a very clear, concise way if they're good. Um, and then I guess more importantly uh, for like presentation posters, especially grants, um, figures are pretty important. I know I've had like a meeting pretty recently um, where we talked about like grad grant fellowship type things and like you have some space for like a figure or two and like having a bad figure is like kind of eh but like if you have a really good figure that like is very good for your application and everything just another thing to keep in mind and so uh time for this thing figure it out where you you guys tell me what's wrong with the figure so i don't have to <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll like explain stuff once we go through this thing. I have like three figures, just like shout out any ideas you have. Um, I'll like explain each thing. So this is the first one from a paper I read recently. Um, each of these like red, yellow things are like axial MRI slices from like different people um, that have been divided up or segmented into tissues seen below, like the muscle, fat, skin, corporal bone. Um, by a, um, you know, just like an automated segmentation thing that they, they made. Um, they're looking at like heating of tissues and how that is affected in like this seven Tesla MRI scanner. And on the bottom right, there's like a little 3D rendering of like one of these stacks of images with like the MRI coils and everything. Um, but yeah, any, any ideas on what, what is wrong with this figure? Are uh, skin and bone the same color? Yeah, it's like real hard <laughs> to tell anything between like fat skin and bone. Um, like I was, I, as someone who was like looking into the same exact thing of like, hey, how well do other people segment their tissues? I was like, I can't see a dang thing on this figure. <laughs> I don't know how good their like results are. Um, that was one thing. Anything else? Also, like, isn't the background white, which is the same as the skin and cortical bone, which means you can't distinguish background from the actual part of the structure? <laughs> or am I just, <laughs> I'm like, because, like, the background, yeah. white and I can't, I'm like, where does it start? Where does it end? Yeah, like, you can't really <laughs> see where the skin is supposed to be. Like, you can see it in the 3D rendering, kind of, but, like, again, it's just, like, all light colors. You can't see anything. Um, like, another minor thing you could say is like, these are all like pretty similar scans. They're just from different people. Um, I don't think it like adds anything to have like all of them um, for like, like different, there's like 23 people took scans. Here they're here, all of them. I don't think it like adds anything to have like all of them in the same figure. You could probably just put one and like blow it up. Um, maybe have like different sections. Um, I don't know if it like contributes anything to the figure. But um, that brings me to my first point just like color tips in general. Um, just like being aware of your choices of color and not just like randomly choosing, like I'll just stick with the defaults for this. Um, think like why you want to use one color versus another, um, especially if you have a lot of different like data or concepts you're trying to put into one figure. Um, for example, um, color can be used to highlight important information, like in the plots shown here, I got from like a one, like the paper that I posted. Um, the left uses like a lot of different colors, which you think in your head might work out for like different plots, but if there's a lot of them overlapping, it's just like messy and jumbled. Um, so on the right side is the same plot, but just depicted differently, um, where you have each sort of series um, that you want to look at more like saturated or have a darker value than the rest of the series that aren't like, they're sort of like grayed out in the background. Um, and so it's a good for like 
comparing things while also focusing on like one thing at a time um, and just like cleaner overall. And so um, you could also imagine you, for this one on the right, you could use um, some color for the like main series graph that you're trying to look at, but overall the one on the right looks a lot cleaner. Um, but yeah, just in general, color is a good way of like directing your reader to where you want to, uh, where you want them to read. Um, you can look, use hue, saturation, or value as a way of forming contrast to like direct the reader. It's used in a lot of paintings and stuff where you might have like everything else is like not very saturated. You might have like one really like, colorful saturated section that you want your viewer to look at. Um, so that's just like one way of using color. And then another way is just like organization and like sort of natural color associations that we have in our mind. Um, some colors are usually associated with specific ideas or emotions, just like in general. Um, so this figure here is one from BioRender, which is just like, I don't personally use, but um, it has like some presets, like images of like cells and like pathways and things that you might find useful. Um, but it's just a good example of using color to like organize things and like help differentiate different cells from each other. Um, for example, endothelial cells here are being shown as red, which we typically associate with blood. So that's like a nice little thing to do. Um, every, the uh, colors overall are like pretty desaturated. There isn't like heavy use of gradients that for whatever reason, scientists really like to use. Um, so it's easier on the eyes and like cleaner. And then I do think there's like an inter interesting choice here. So like the neuron is green and like the dendritic cells are yellow probably could have switched those just like by association neurons and like anatomy textbooks and stuff are typically depicted as yellow. Um, but here, um, it also like the green contrasts pretty well with the HSV particles. Um, so just a bit of like a personal design choice, I guess. Um, but yeah, so this is the next one. This one's uh, a little ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, this is from a figure from a paper from 2006. It's from like a random journal I found through Reddit. Um, but it's a legit paper on Elsevier, El Elsevier, however you pronounce it. Um, it hasn't been retracted or anything. It's still out there. Um, I'll show you the figure caption later, but just like try to guess what this is. What in the word art? <laughs> Are these amino acid sequences? Can't even yeah. tell. Yeah, they are. <laughs> um, this is a figure caption. It's supposed to be some type of like, I guess it's supposed to be like that like cardboard box looking thing, like closing as a result of some kind of interaction with this PEX5 thing, but like, I don't want to know that without the figure caption. Um, brings me to my next point. Um, relatively speaking, it's good um, if you can tell what a figure is about without having to consult the figure text. Um, it, that, that was like a very extreme example, but kind of illustrates that like you don't have any idea what this figure is about without the caption, maybe unless you're familiar with amino acids and them being depicted that way, but kind of defeats the purpose of like having a figure to illustrate the concept. Um, at the same time, it like kind of shows how important the figure text or caption is to like guiding the reader how uh, to read your figure, um, which kind of also wasn't accomplished, but uh, it, gave, it might give you a better idea of what's happening. So if you want like a good figure, you need to think about like the level of detail you need, which I think normally you'd think like, oh, be as minimal as possible. Um, but that's not always the case. Like sometimes like some embellishments or like, like arrows or something to help guide the reader is also important to help people who are like, aren't as familiar with your field, like know how to read something in terms of figure. Um, but like as an example below, um, the left is like the original figure of like this cell and um, sort of these, um, like signaling pathway type stuff. Um, and the right is like the figure that's been corrected, sort of been like more minimalismed, if you will, um, by removing some of the outlines and color, for example. Um, like you 
on the left, the cytoplasm and the cell membrane is like colored in and stuff. And on the right, it's grayed out because you don't really need to pay attention to it. Um, they also removed a lot of the arrows and consolidated a lot of the text to the bottom. Um, and even after like a lot of this stuff, you might think, oh, like it'd look probably look a lot cleaner without the text. You can put that into the figure caption. But you could also argue that um, it's easier to read and follow sort of the order of things when the info is presented like this with like IDF1 does this and then Foxy1 does this. It's like a little bit easier to um, see everything when you have that color association um, as opposed to having it like in black and white text in a figure caption. And then just like one sort of last thing in terms of composition um, to keep things less colored for the actual figure is just like generally, if, if you don't normally use this, just use vector art, um, aka like the pen tool on Photoshop or Illustrator um, because vector art is scalable, looks a lot cleaner as opposed to um, like raster type images where you just have the image and you have to like rescale it. Um, yeah, that's just another thing. And then this is the last figure. Um, this one's a little busy, but they're basically looking at activity of like two enzymes, PET6 and PET2, um, that degrade the polymer PET. Um, but they're, they're using like some ester instead as a test to see like enzyme activity over like different conditions of like temperature or carbon chain length and pH. So like on the each of the scales is like a zero percent to hundred percent. It's like that's enzyme activity, and then it's over like temperature and like all those different things for the, both of the enzymes. Um, what do you think is wrong with this one? Uh, they've taken what could be a bar graph and turned them into like giant donuts. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like a weird way of representing some pretty straightforward data, I think. It's like visually interesting, especially with like the colors and stuff. And it's like a unique format, but like it's kind of confusing, especially if you're not like used to having stuff presented this way. It's like a little easier to identify peaks in the data, kind of like how in Pokemon it's like, oh, like this one has the most special attack or whatever. Um, but um, it's harder to see like trends and stuff this way. So you could probably like tempt that to see like a line plot or a bar plot. Um, this might be a dumb question, but like, how would you determine like statistical significance and stuff with like that kind of plot? I'm really just not used to seeing it, but like, how do you? Yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't see like error bars or anything in this type of plot usually, or and like at most, if you're trying to compare things, you'd like stack them, but I haven't seen any like. Okay. usage of this type of plot. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so the next and final thing is just like data visualization. Just choose the right graph to represent your data. Um, it should present things clearly and concisely. Um, so it's easy to follow like outliers, trends, whatever, um, or if there isn't any. Uh, but also don't mislead the reader. Like don't like, stretch out your axes so it looks more significant than it really is. Like. Um, be sure to accurately represent your data. Um, and in terms of like options, um, I'm sure you're all aware of the many things that are out there, but like um, I found like a couple that weren't used very often that might be useful to you all. Um, there's smooth scatter plots. So you have a, if you have scatter plots that like have way too many points and you can't see anything, um, you can kind of smooth it out um, and represent it as sort of like a density. Um, and depending on your application, this might be useful. Um, I know, I think, I think it's used in immunology a lot for full cytometry. I could be wrong, but, um, yeah, just a cool way of representing that type of data. And then waterfall plots I've used, um, a couple of times. Um, they're like a spectrum, you have, you have multiple spectrum plots. And so if you, you, if you want to monitor how that spectrum changes over time or with concentration or something, um, you can use this to look at peaks and how they change. And um, you might be able to get away with using like just regular line plots depending on your application and how like it changes, but just like another cool lesser used plot that I've used before.
But yeah, um, that's basically everything. Um, if you take away anything from this, just like make every part of your figure with intention. Like think about why you're using a certain color, why you're organizing a certain way based on like your audience um, and like what message you're trying to convey. Um, use vector graphics when you can. And then like also just like in general, try drawing stuff. Like you don't have to be an artist, but like um, it's just really useful as a skill to like put your ideas into some type of visual, be able to like sketch it out somehow. Not only for things like chalk talks or like interviews or anything where you don't have like access to a PowerPoint per se, um, but like I've personally used it for like prototyping experiments or like trying to prototype figures. Um, it's just a real useful way to like get everything down to some pl some place where I can like look at things and see whether or not something's possible. Um, but yeah, also if you don't draw or don't want to draw or like don't have time to make the figures on your own, like try hiring an artist or a graphic designer. There's a lot of them that could use the work and could do your job very well. Um, and then finally, just some tools to use. I know Illustrator and Photoshop are like pretty popular and like widely used. But if you don't have like access to Adobe Creative Cloud or whatever, um, I personally use uh, Inkscape for my vector art stuff. It's free. It's like pretty bare bones, but like you don't really need that much to like do stuff. Um, obviously, if you have like graphs and stuff, you can use like Python or MATLAB, whatever you like to use. R has some pretty nice like default aesthetics. Um, and finally, BioRender. Um, I feel like I've heard a lot more about it recently, but like it's just got like a bunch of preset scientific graphics for like diagrams and stuff, like cells or like proteins or whatever. Um, so if you're okay with like using those presets for your figures, that's like another fast option. And then like for color, like a couple of cool things I found while like trying to figure out the pre this presentation were. Uh, color review, which like tells you how visible your colors are on top of each other, which is especially useful for like making sure your presentations and things are viewable by colorblind people or like just viewable in general. Um, and then this viz palette thing that I found, uh, basically like someone just wrote some program to like display a bunch of different plot types with a color palette that you specify. Um, so you can test out how they look on different types of graphs and stuff. Um, but yeah, there's obviously a lot more things out there, but these are just ones that stood out to me. Um, that's everything.